Hi, I'm Ron. Thanks for checking this out. I hope you have your flute handy. Today we're going to look at a special fingering that will help you to increase your vocabulary and enjoy your Native American flute even more. Uh, I'll show you the fingering first and then we'll look at a few keyboard graphics just to help us understand musically a little bit how this will help us. Then I'll give you some practice tips to help you become confident uh, that you can use this fingering. And then stick around for a little bonus footage at the end. I'm filming this in mid-December and I'll show you how this fingering can help you play a couple of seasonal favorites. So grab your favorite medium A Native American or Native American style flute and we'll get started. I'm assuming here that uh, you are familiar with what uh, most of us native flute players call basic scale. Uh, if you're not, you might want to go to my Enjoying Your Native American Flute playlist and look at some of the more introductory videos. I like to number the fingerings of our basic scale one through six, starting at the bottom. So just as a way of quick review, one through six going from bottom to top. Right now, where we are really going to be focused today is right here between fingering four and fingering five. Listen to that. Here's fingering four. And here's five. Now, when musicians use the word interval, uh, what we mean is the distance between two notes, and you can measure that in a lot of ways. But as you'll see pretty soon in our keyboard graphic when I pull that up, uh, the distance between the notes that sound fingering four to fingering five is actually pretty big. And the new fingering we're going to work on today helps us begin to fill in that gap. So again, here's fingering four. Here's five. Here's our new fingering. I'm going to turn this way so that you can really see very clearly which holes are covered and which ones are not. And here's a graphic to show you the same thing. All right, now I'm going to go back and forth from fingering four to fingering five, but I'm going to put our new fingering in between and listen to how it helps start to fill in that gap. I'm gonna play that again. I'm going to put up little graphics of fingering so you can see exactly what my fingerings are doing and feel free to hit pause at any point along the way if you need to, uh, if you want to practice this. So here it is again with some graphics so that you can see exactly what's going on with the fingers. Now, some of the moves here are a little tricky, in fact, getting back and forth between the new fingering and fingering five, uh, you'll notice that three fingers are on the move at the same time, and they're not all, all even moving in the same direction. So we'll talk about some ways to practice this in a little bit. But first, let's look at some keyboard graphics and try to begin to visualize just exactly what this fingering is going to do for us. Here's a photo of a standard keyboard. Most of you are already familiar with this lovely alternating pattern of three and two black keys that helps us stay oriented while we're playing. Don't even have to look at the keys all that much. It helps you stay where you need to be. Underneath here in purple numbers, these are our basic scale fingerings, one through six, and the keys that they correspond to on a keyboard, and underneath that are the letter names from Western Music Theory. Understand that uh, keyboards are generally tuned to a modern Euroclassical equal tempered system. Our Native American flutes are not, so all of these correspondences are approximate, but they are close enough for musical purposes and for making cool music. Uh, one thing I'd like for you to notice that fingering one of basic scale and fingering six 
both have the letter A underneath them. If you've seen my video on tuning, you know that's because they are octave equivalents. That simply means that this pitch is vibrating about twice as fast as this one. And we consider those notes then for musical purposes to be identical, and that's why they have the same name. Uh, we were talking about the musical term interval earlier in Western theory. When we move from one key to the very, very next one on a keyboard, we say we have moved a half a step. So if we move two keys, we therefore have moved a whole step. Notice that as we move from fingering two to three on our flute, we have skipped one key. So to move from basic scale note two to basic scale note three is in musical terms to move a whole step. What we are especially interested in today is the distance between fingering four and fingering five. And what I'd like for you to notice here is that we actually move three half steps. We move to this key, then to this one, then to this one we could say that we've moved a full step and a half. That's a big musical distance. For those of you who are musicians, you know that that uh, musical interval is known as a minor third. Right? So our new fingering is going to help us to start to fill in that gap. And the new fingering is going to do this for us. Let me bring up another keyboard. Now our new fingering is shown in red, and you can see that it will produce a note that's approximately associated with this key. Uh, I like to think of this in uh, terms of our fingerings as four with a little carrot, the carrot meaning that we've raised the fourth fingering a little bit, and that corresponds on the keyboard by moving one key to the right, and its letter name is F. So now this gap is partially closed in, and you see that we have almost a full alphabet, right? We're missing a letter down here, but we can actually fill that in in the upper register, as we will see later. For now, this is what we want to be aware of, that we have partially filled in this gap with our new fingering, so that we now are moving four, four carat, five, and on our medium A flutes, that corresponds to pitch E, F, and G. I've actually heard some people say that when we're playing our Native American flutes, we should just always leave the ring finger of our top hand down all the time. Now, if that were actually the intent, flute makers wouldn't bother to drill a hole there. You've undoubtedly noticed already that our new fingering involves uncovering that hole and getting our ring finger on the top hand to go up and down. Now, our ring fingers are the weakest fingers on our hands. So sometimes it takes a little practice to get comfortable with getting our ring fingers to go up and down, especially independently. Uh, I find that when I'm trying to learn something new, uh, it helps to kind of practice it in isolation first. And, uh, and then try to make music out of it. So um, here are some things you can try to start to get comfortable with this fingering. Uh, I would maybe even start initially um, not even blowing into the flute while you're practicing this. It might be a good place to start just starting on finger four, fingering four, and then try to go back and forth between it and the new fingering. And you'll notice that while ring finger is going up on the top hand, the index finger on the lower hand is going down, and then they swap. So it's just that back and forth motion. Now, we have talked before about economic finger motion, not moving our fingers more than we need to to vent holes. I am exaggerating my finger movements greatly now so that you can see exactly what I'm doing. But if I were playing, I wouldn't be moving nearly this much. Now, once your fingers get comfortable with that motion, then maybe try playing. Uh, I find it helpful initially to, uh, to tongue each note. It helps coordinate the fingers a little bit. It's like everything moves together then, your tongue and your fingers. So maybe just try a very simple pattern like this.
Right now, once you get comfortable with that, you can maybe try it without tonguing, but that takes some special coordination. It's, a, it's really easy to get sounds like this unintentionally. If the fingers are not moving together. So it's possible to do it smoothly without tonguing, but initially uh, I think it'll be helpful for you to get your tongue involved. Kind of triggers the fingers and get everything moving together. Now the move from fingering five to our new fingering is even more complicated because now we have three fingers moving and they're not even moving all in the same direction. So here's fingering five and then ring finger again is going up but middle finger top hand and index finger bottom hand are coming down. And then we do exactly the opposite. So this can be a little tricky feeling for a lot of people. So again, I would maybe just practice it in isolation. Just get your fingers coordinated. Then worry about, you know, putting air through the flute at the same time. You'll probably notice also that when your ring finger goes up, your pinky finger is going to want to go with it. That's okay. That doesn't matter. Pinky doesn't have to get any place anyway. So don't worry about that. All right, then once that's feeling comfortable, again, I would tongue each note while practicing those two fingerings. Right then, when you have both of those pairs of notes feeling comfortable, the new note with four, the new note with five, then make a little three note pattern out of it uh, and just go back and forth. Here are some graphics again. I'll play it again, show you some graphics so that you can see exactly what the fingers are doing. Once you're feeling really comfortable with that, then maybe you can start working this new fingering into basic scale in its entirety. Um, I'm not going to stand up to try to show you this, but here's what it, it would sound like just going up and down basic scale, but adding in our new fingering. Now, what I want you to do for the time being is just get comfortable with that new fingering, right? And then follow your ears, trust your ears. As you get more comfortable with the fingering, melodic patterns will start to suggest themselves and just kind of trust that, have fun with it, play with it. And then in the coming months, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the musical possibilities that open up to us once we have that fingering really firmly under command. So I hope you enjoy that. hope you found it helpful. If you need any more clarification, you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment box and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, stick around now for a little bonus footage and I'll show you a couple of seasonal songs that become quite playable when we have upper register notes under control and our new fingering under control. If you don't feel like you have those upper register notes under control, go to my, uh, my Enjoying Your Native Flute playlist. There are a couple of videos there about exactly that, and I will put links to them in the description box. Blah, that's a mouthful. Uh, in the description box as well. All right. Thanks for hanging out, and uh, stick around for a little bonus footage. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I hope you will find this fun. I'm going to start on the second note of basic scale, and I'm going to start going up. And on the way, I'm going to add in our new fingering that we learned today. And when I get into upper register, I'm going to use this fingering and then our top note fingering. And if I use all of those things, it allows me to play this.
musicians will recognize that as a major scale. Lots of the songs we hear every day are based on major scale patterns, including this seasonal song. Now, I'm going to back up from the mic a little bit because this is some high register stuff and I don't want it to, to distort on us. Here we go. I'm not uh, going to show you all my fingers here because I know you can figure this out on your own. This is not a specially tuned flute. This is my regular A minor flute that I use all the time. You don't need a specially tuned flute to play outside of basic scale. You just need to learn the flute that you have well. All right, uh, here's a slightly different pattern in the upper register. Instead of using this, I'm just going to uncover all the holes. This is an alternate fingering on some flutes. So is this on some flutes. Sounds slightly different now. Here's what the scale pattern sounds like now. If you're into modes, you might recognize that as Mixolydian mode but uh, I'm going to use it in a slightly different way. I'm going to use it to make this note be the center of gravity. The tune is actually going to end here. See if you can figure out how it works. Here's a keyboard graphic for Joy to the World, and uh, again here the, the blue numbers and letters refer to notes that are in basic scale. Notice that for this song I'm not using uh, fingering one at all. Uh, and then there are three new fingerings added, two of them upper register we've talked about in other videos. Uh, go review my Enjoying the High Notes videos if you want a refresher on those. And here's the new pitch we're dealing with today. So you can see now that uh, for this song, we need the full musical alphabet, and we have it here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all present and accounted for, and that allows us to play the song Joy to the World. And I'm going to go ahead to the next keyboard here. We've made a slight difference here. You'll see it right here. B has been replaced uh, with B flat. In musical terms, flat just means take a note and move it down a half step. So B, we've gone down to the very next key, B flat. I'm using six with one carat to indicate the B flat. I used six with two carats to, to show that we had uh, moved six up two keys to get B natural. Right. Now, this also gives us a, a full music alphabet, but a slightly different one. And what's, uh, what's fun about Good, Good King Venceslas is it's a melody that uses all of these notes, but the final note, the center of gravity where the tune wants to end, isn't at the bottom of the scale like it was for the Joy to the World. Instead, it's here in the middle. So this song actually ends on this key. All right, I hope you have a good time figuring out how to play those and enjoy the new fingering. Thanks for sticking around and I will see you again next time.